Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of you online. My, as Bizwa mentioned, my name is Dimitri Grappas, and I'm a data scientist at Creative Data Solutions and also in Genome Analytics at Monsanto. And today, today is it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, metabolomics and beyond, some challenges and strategies for next generation omic analyses. So before I start, a little bit of background about me. So I was born in um, Minsk, Belarus. Later, I received my bachelor's in both biology and chemistry from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I then went on to get my PhD in analytical chemistry with emphasis in biotechnology at the University of California, Davis, and did a postdoc in Oliver Fiend's lab, after which I became the principal statistician at the West Coast Metabolomic Center. And so currently, I am a data scientist um, near St. Louis, Missouri, um, for both Creative Data Solutions and Genome Analytics at Monsanto. And so some of my interests are, I'm going to speak to you about them today, but really they're omic integration, machine learning, data visualization, and software design. So my experience in metabolomic and, and omic data analysis and visualization is kind of varied. And so um, things, so I'm interested in the past, I've been interested in things like biomarker discovery and validation. Um, with both metabolomics and proteomics and genomics. Uh, I have a big interest in network analysis and visualization and also this idea of network mapping, which I'll talk a little bit more um, at the end. And all along, you know, I've been doing uh, multivariate modeling and visualization to kind of analyze this, this data kind of in a cohesive, holistic, uh, given a holistic approach. So what is metabolomics? Um, so metabolomics, has many definitions, but here's mine. So it's the study of small molecules. And wh where does it fit in kind of this hierarchy of this biochemical signaling cascade? Well, if our genome is what can happen and our transcriptome is what appears to be happening, then, our, then the proteome or the enzymes are what make it happen. But the metabolites, they are what is or has happened. So, and this is, this is very uh, interesting because if we're interested in the phenotype, we, the closest we can get to the phenotype is really measuring the metabolome. And so, so not, not only is the metabolome kind of closest to the phenotype, but it's also very responsive. So it, there's some uh, feedback talk, interaction with the proteins, the transcripts, and DNA. And so oftentimes researchers, you know, focus on, on genomic analyses because it's very powerful, it's becoming cheap, but they forget one thing. If you're interested in the phenotype, the phenotype is the genotype plus the environment, the interaction between the genotype and your environment. That's your phenotype. And what better way to measure the environment than to do metabolomics? I mean, this is probably the best way to measure the environmental input. But, so this is a very promising area, which I think is going to be, in the future, gaining even more traction than now. But there are some challenges as we move forward. And so this is what I'd like to talk to you about today. So metabolomics, we're beginning to do larger and larger and more complicated studies. And so this has challenges. Uh, how do we uh, normalize data, which has been acquired in many batches over years? How do we combine data for many instruments? Um, and then also, we're starting, we're beginning to look at our um, experiments from many different angles. So we're combining genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and metabolomics. So one challenge is, well, how do we combine all of that information and to understand what, what are the interactions, what is happening? And finally, given this mass of data from different instruments, different omic domains, how do we integrate this within some kind of biological context? Because at the end, I mean, for now, it's the human that needs to interpret this. It really needs to be human readable. And so to start off with the complexity of large studies. So <clears throat> increasingly, we're, we're beginning to do large longitudinal studies. If we're interested in identifying very small phenotypic and environmental effects. So kind of the low-hanging fruits we've kind of been picked. And so now we're kind of setting our aim at kind of the more recalcitrant diseases, uh, a good example of which is type 1 diabetes. And so there is a very kind of forward-thinking um, study, the TEDDY study. So this is the environmental determinants of diabetes in the young. Uh, 
And this is kind of state of the art, I think, in metabolomics as far as size um, of a study. And so the, the idea is that um, children and twins are followed through time longitudinally, and many, many measurements are taken uh, of them over time, like infectious agents, dietary factors, environmental agents, psychological factors, uh, genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And so with the goal being that we can identify this very small effect, which might be leading some to become type 1 diabetic and protecting others. And so uh, the West Coast Metabolomic Center was tasked with doing all of the metabolomic analysis uh, with primary metabolites and also uh, lipids. And so this is probably one of the largest metabolomic studies I'm aware of. So it's been carried out uh, over three years, and there's over 15,000 samples, which might not sound much, but is very large, I think, for metabolomics. And so immediately, one challenge is, <clears throat> how do you maintain equivalent acquisition conditions over the full three-year period? Because as you can imagine, your instruments are changing, your technicians are changing, your, everything could be changing. And so this graph is just showing you the abundance within a given batch for a single analyte over time. And so this is a quality control sample. So it should be identical. As you can see that as you, uh, in different dates and different months, you're having different trends and different inputs. Now, this is a problem because if you're trying to identify a very minute effect size like type 1 diabetes, um, it might be completely masked with this analytical variance that you've just added to your sample because of kind of the challenges of measuring it without adding noise to it. So for example, here, the first, this is a principal component analysis of the same data where these ellipses are showing different months and you can see time is kind of the dominant factor. So you're not going to see anything about type 1 diabetes unless you can figure out how to remove this. And so, our tools to remove this kind of analytical noise are normalizations. And there's a variety of different normal types of normalization. Probably the most widely used is the use of internal standards. And so internal standards are essentially you add some compounds to all of your samples before you analyze, and then at the end, you, you measure how much you got back. And so you know how much you added, you know how much you got back, and you can calculate some kind of a correction factor that you can apply to other analytes. So now this is a great method, but it's still might not remove kind of the more nuanced batch effects. And so here's an example again of a PCA plot where this is your raw data, and so you have some kind of variance associated with it where each ellipse is a three-month period in this case. And so you can look at that even after doing your internal standard correction, you've tightened your variance, but you still haven't removed these batch effects. And so this is, this is still a problem you need to think about. And so one approach, one, another tool to add to your toolbox is the use of analytical replicate-based normalization. And so essentially, for the Teddy study, what was done was that every 10 samples, we analyzed a quality control sample throughout the whole study, throughout the whole three years. And so this is an identical sample. And so what we can do later on is we can look at what is the trend for our quality controls for a given analyte. So this is this visualization showing you in white, this is kind of the analytical trend for our quality controls. And then in pink, this is our samples. So this is very good. So we can see that we can be very confident that this kind of spike, this bump in the middle, this is not biological. This is completely analytical. So we can try to identify some kind of a normalization that can then flatten this trend in our QCs, and then we would like to apply that to our samples. So one, I think, a very promising approach for this is using LOIS, or locally estimated scatter plot smoothing. And so here's an example of a LOIS model being trained on the data, where the black line are your quality controls, and the red are your samples. So essentially, no knowledge of your samples are being used to do this normalization. The model is built completely from your quality controls and then applied to your samples. And so the combination of uh, an internal standard method followed by lowest normalization is, does successfully remove the time component. So this is nice now. So, for example, so there are no differences in time with regards to this data. So this is what we wanted. Now, not only are we doing very large studies and we're challenged by normalization, but we're increasingly combining different metabolomic platforms within our study. So here's a good example. So this is a study uh, looking at an uh, animal model of type 1 diabetes. And so the goal was to identify which lipids might be associated with beta cell loss in the pancreas. And so kind of our targets for the study were lipids. But nowadays, if you're thinking about lipids, you cannot use a single instrument to measure all lipids. So for example, you might do your structural lipids with one instrument. Uh, if you want to look at your oxygenated or if you're signaling lipids, you're going to need another instrument. 
if you wanted to get your free fatty acids and some members of the primary metabolism, you're going to need a third instrument. And so now the challenge becomes that, well, you're going to have to think about normalization for each instrument independently, then you're going to have to merge the data and then make sure you haven't made any kind of artifacts which are instrument specific. So this, this is another thing you need to consider. <clears throat> so not only are we combining instruments, but really we're increasingly moving towards the combination of different omic platforms. And so th this is a good example of that, uh, of a study doing that. This is a study by David Liesenfeld. And so the goals were to essentially analyze visceral and subcutaneous adipose tissue and plasma in patients with a colorectal cancer. And uh, additionally add to that uh, transcriptomic and gene expression profiling. And so, as you can imagine, this study used many different instruments. I mean, so for the lipids, you know, the three instruments to do the lipidomics, then you have your transcriptomics, and then you kind of have this explosion because now you're looking at three different tissue types, your visceral adipose, your subcutaneous, and your plasma. So not only are you going to be challenged analytically to make sure that all of these are clean, but you also need to start thinking about how are you going to be integrating all of this information into kind of one cohesive analysis. And so David, in this case, Liesenfeld, did a really great job where essentially, you know, there's some very nice findings where he identified that <clears throat> specific lipid species <clears throat> which were associated with patient's tumor stage. And so this is kind of the holy grail. This is, this is what we would like to do. You know, this is kind of the next generation of, of biomarker studies. And as we move forward, this, this isn't a trend that's going to be going away. Um, so, I mean, increasingly, we're going to be looking to integrate multiple omic platforms, so things like genomic analysis with proteomic and metabolomic. And so certain diseases might have a very dominant genetic component. Others, like, for example, like uh, aging or metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes, these diseases have a very dominant uh, metabolic component and a relatively low genomic um, com component to it. So, for example, uh, doing a large GWAS study uh, looking at type 2 diabetes, markers of type 2 diabetes in the general population, you're going to get about 10, you can explain about 10% of the variance in the population um, looking at the, your genes, transcripts, and proteins. But now if you add to that your metabolites, all of a sudden now you can explain about 40%. And the goal is going to be that it's, it's greater than the sum of, uh, of, the, of the parts, that adding all of this information together, you're going to get a new view of each one of the layers. And so, as you can imagine, this is, this is a challenging endeavor, but one that we need to start thinking about because this is, this is the way that we're going towards. So you might, you yourself in metabolomics might not be doing all of these analyses, but I think increasingly you're going to be collaborating with other researchers who are, and they're going to, you're going to want to integrate your data at the end. And so uh, here's a mini review that we just published on some strategies, some common strategies for omic data integration. And so probably the most accessible and widely used approaches for integrating genomic, proteomic, and metabolomic data include the use of biochemical pathways. So mapping genes and proteins to some kind of predefined pathway, which some expert defined. Now, a pathway-independent method would be like a network-based approach, where you just take a database which describes all the possible relationships between genes and proteins, and you just build a network from that. And so you're not limited to a pathway. You just What you get is a large network. Now, kind of the final approach, and probably one of the most easiest, is doing empirical correlation. So this is, you're just looking at linear relationships between the species that you measured. And so here's an example of a pathway analysis where the circles are your metabolites and the squares are your genes. And so taking uh, any one of the platforms alone, you might have a different view. So for example, with metabolites, you might see that this is a comparison um, in lung cancer where the blue, metabolite is blue, it's decreased in lung cancer tissue compared to control. And so if you did metabolomic analysis, you might conclude, well, glycolysis seems to be going down in lung cancer because all of these species are blue. Now, if you did proteomic analysis, well, you, it looks like the opposite. Well, the proteins are increasing. Look, all of the proteins are red. So maybe glycolysis is increasing in, um, in lung cancer. But now if you combine them together, now you look at for things which are going the same direction in different platforms. And so all of a sudden, the things which would become interesting are the actual metabolites which are going up. 
So now cysteine and glutamine. Aha. Uh -huh. So this kind of becomes the driving story. So proteins are going up, metabolites are going down, and looks like there's some kind of a shuttling of this metabolic flux, flux into glutamate and cysteine. So now this becomes interesting. But some issues are this is dependent on an expert definition of a pathway, and genes and proteins are considered equivalent. Now, if you want to escape the pathway, we can turn to a metabolomic network analysis. So here is an example of that where we have over 1,200 metabolites, which are connected either by based on biochemical reactions with these uh, red edges or by structural similarity from the PubChem database. And so the two methods together kind of are really necessary to kind of fill in the gaps where for some analytes, like over here, you might know a lot about their biochemistry and so they're well connected, while for others, like lipids, you see there's very little known and you really need structural similarity to time together. And so while I was at the West Coast Metabolomic Center, I developed a tool called MetaMapper. So this allows for metabolomic network calculation, which incorporates the KEG database and PubChem, and also a variety of chemical identifier translations through CTS. And so you could do things like uh, calculate biochemical reactions, uh, do connections based on structural similarity, and also include your mass spectra, which becomes very interesting for unknown analytes, and then look at empirical relationships. And so also you have the facility to uh, visualize your data interactively or export to Cytoscape and build some of your network. And so if you want to add to your metabolite genes and proteins, uh, there are a variety of tools that exist for that, but I'd just like to highlight GRIN. So this is a tool developed uh, by Quanjira watching the Sanarak at the West Coast Metabolomic Center, which kind of extends the idea of uh, metabolic connections. And so now metabolites are linked together through a protein, which is responsible for their production, and then the gene is mapped to the protein. And so now this is very nice where you can, you can incorporate your metabolites, genes, and proteins on a network-independent basis, or sorry, on a pathway-independent basis, and then you can also do some kind of a pathway or network-based enrichment where you're using kind of a graph theory to identify little modules in your, in your graph, which seems to be more enriched or more important using some kind of statistical background. And so all along I've been talking about making networks. And so networks define the connections in your data, but you also want to uh, essentially map information to your nodes or your metabolites or your genes. And so to do that, these, these mappings are your statistical analysis, multivariate analysis, functional things. And so the concept of doing this is, is I termed uh, network mapping. And so you should think about this as your network is your coloring book. This is, defines all the possible relationships. Your mappings uh, are your crayons. These are all your statistical approaches. And then you altering the properties of your network, your node and your edge attributes is you coloring your coloring book or mapping all this data to a network. And so you all along have been showing you map networks, and I just wanted to define it. So to generate your crayons, generate your mappings, uh, so I also developed another tool called DVMWeb. So this is a multivariate uh, analysis tool, so it runs on your desktop or in a browser. And so you could do things like uh, interactive visualization using JavaScript graphics, uh, various statistical analyses like pairwise comparisons, ANOVA, power analysis, correlation, then turning to something more multivariate like hierarchical cluster analysis and mapping uh, various metadata to try to identify uh, what explains the kind of the cluster pattern in your data. So you can do this in correlation or raw. Uh, and then finally things like principal component analysis. So you can do these multivariate projection techniques. So on a multivariate level, try to identify differences on your samples while all along really the emphasis is visualization. Um, and also included in here are uh, tools for predictive modeling, for example, probably the most widely used algorithms in metabolomics, uh, orthogonal partial least squares, or OPLSDA. Uh, you can do that as well in here. And then finally, you can ship everything to this pathway analysis modules. We're using KEG. You can do it for any number. All of the organisms in KEG and all of the pathways, all you really need are full changes in your comparison groups, and then you can map it on any network um, of your preference. And so. That's kind of the big picture, and you know, there's a lot left to be done moving forward. But this is this is kind of the current state. And so, with that, I'd really like to thank the Metabolomics Society, particularly the Early Career Members Network and BISWA for inviting me. My collaborators at the West Coast Metabolomics Center: Dr. Johannes Farman, Dr. Quinjira Wachinasanarak, uh, 
and all, uh, Dr. Oliver Fiem and uh, Susanna Mamora, and finally David, David Liesenfeld. And so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask, uh, or you can email me later. If you're interested in the things I talked about, you want more information, um, you can check out my website, where I'll also post all of the slides if you want to download those. Uh, you can check out my software on GitHub, and uh, if you're interested in some of the work I'm talking about and would like to hire me, feel free to contact me at createdatasoul at gmail.com. And so with that, thank you for your attention.